Thanks, Wynn, and, and thanks to the commission for inviting us. It's an honor to be here today. Los Angeles is the best place to be in the world. I truly am a booster. Um, but uh, today we're going to have a bit of a different presentation. It's going to be a science-heavy presentation. So I'm here as the kind of gentle scientist among the group to help us <laughs> broker some of what we'll be talking about and why it's important that we're having this discussion today. So with, uh, without further ado, what I want to do is, is get into this question about why do we need to be thinking about something beyond oral daily Truvada as HIV prophylaxis? Well, the reason for that is because around the world, if you can take a pill every day or two pills every day and do it every day, then you really don't need any more help. The, the, the medication, the, the advancements that have happened over the past 30 years have got us to the point where we can successfully constrain viremia. We know how to do this. Um, it requires, though, someone taking a pill out of the bottle and putting it in their mouth and taking it every single day. That requires a lot of compliance. I can't do that. I know there's a number of people who I work with who can't do that. And so many of the advances in science bypass the people who I work with and value and love working with and look forward to helping them have a better life. So we really need to move beyond oral daily treatments for people who are trying to avoid becoming HIV infected. Because for a significant minority of people, if you look at that cascade, there's always about 40% somewhere in that. It's a significant minority. It's a minority, but it's a significant minority of people who can't adhere to whatever it is that's required. Going to the doctor all the time, taking those pills, doing whatever it might be. It's, it's, it's a problem. Now, one of the things that's common across a, a good amount of those folks is that they suffer from disorganizing conditions that would interfere with them being able to meet these demands. Things like substance use problems, mental health problems. Other factors that interfere with consistent engagement with ART is treatment or prevention. And these can include things like not having a place to sleep regularly or not having access to regular meals. Some people call that the social determinants of health, these factors that everybody needs, three meals a day, a place to sleep, safety in their life, before they can begin to think about things other than those basic needs. So the fact that we have this group, this minority, um, and that we can't seem to get our arms around being able to figure out how to bring these people into the access of benefits of these medications means that we virtually assure a source for viremia in our population here in Los Angeles. We really have seen and we know these epi data that despite, in, in spite of all the money we throw at the problem, we still have increasing new infections, particularly in gay and bisexual men and in black heterosexual women and other key populations here in, in, in Los Angeles like transgender individuals. So we got work to do. Getting to zero infections is going to require more of us and more of those living with HIV to sustain viral suppression and those at high risk to maintain consistent HIV prevalence, prevention uh, vigilance than is the current situation. This is a schematic that I like to think about that this significant minority doesn't live within constrained sort of boundaries. It's a fluid boundary. So when people are having these conditions that interfere with them being able to take medications, they still interact with the general population. They still have sex. They still engage all sorts of activities um, with people who may not be infected or may be far away from the risk environment. So, so th there's a real, real need for us to get a hold of this, this, this problem that people who are HIV positive, at-risk negatives, that have structural factors that interfere with health, that have health disparities and stigma, that we need to come up with a combination of interventions that combine behavioral, biomedical, technological, technological and structural interventions to be able to get our arms around these folks and help them stay focused on health. In Los Angeles, why do I love LA? Well, one of the reasons is because there are some really big problems here. And one of the best things to do for somebody like me is to get involved in trying to fix problems. That's, that's my job. So it's a great place to be. We got some big problems here. We've been able to show in HPTN 061 over time that among high risk black MSM here in Los Angeles, we have an incidence rate of 6.9%, almost 7%. Okay? 
we came in with another study, HP10073, and showed that even by providing oral daily Trovada to these folks who are high risk, we really didn't impact incidence much. So I can't go into the specifics of this. I can tell you that these, these findings are embargoed and being presented at the AIDS conference next week in Durban, but it was disappointing that four out of 76 people here in Los Angeles who had access, actual bottles of Truvada in their hand, zero converted. So what's the take home from that? The take home is that just giving people medication, bringing them into our medical system, isn't necessarily going to prevent infection. That we have a greater demand on us to begin to meet the needs of our people. Um, and then it's always good to remember that there's a whole group of people out there in Los Angeles who are using stimulants, gay and bisexual men who are using stimulants, who continue to also have rising incidence rates. So this idea about being able to look clearly, fearlessly at the problems that face our population is, is an important first step. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We've got a big problem with incidents in Los Angeles. When you look around the U.S. to find a com comparable city, maybe Atlanta, but certainly it's worse than any place I know about in terms of thinking about HIV as a problem that we need to really pay attention to, that just providing oral daily Truvada is not going to do this. It's not going to work. The data that I've seen and the people who I work with just providing a bottle of tablets is not going to move the needle. We gotta move beyond. So, the exciting part for today is that we have two of the most brilliant scientists on the planet here who live in Los Angeles and work with me. I'm a lucky guy. We're gonna be talking about two completely different ways that we might be able to get our arms around this problem in people who are at risk for becoming HIV infected. One is going to be using a long-acting form of an antiretroviral therapy, and another is going to be talking about ways to harness the body's own immune system to be able to fight off infection. And both of these approaches require very infrequent visits to see doctors and to take medicine. So without further ado, I'm going to leave you here. We're going to come back at this in terms of like giving ways to find um, participation in these studies, because these are um, ongoing or will be opening soon, but um, there's a lot of opportunity here, and I, uh, I'll introduce next Dr. Rafi Landovitz. I believe you're up next. So thanks, Steve, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to come back and speak with you again. It's been a, a little while since I've, I've um, had a chance to speak with you all about pre-exposure prophylaxis which is something you know that I um, feel pretty passionate about. Um, not that it's the solution to all problems, but that it's a really important tool in our HIV prevention toolbox to have available. And as Steve was saying, we still have an enormous problem with HIV incidence here in Los Angeles. And his data from the HPTN073 study shows us that in our most vulnerable populations, just handing them a bottle of pills is not gonna fix the problem. And, and I think many of you probably suspected that and knew that in your hearts before that data was available, but I think it's important to show because it, it does give us opportunities um, to move the field forward and convinces people who have large amounts of money to, to use to do that kind of research that, that there is a problem and, and, and helps us actually do that. So um, with your blessing, I'm gonna sort of take us back a little bit and just remind people a little bit what the scientific data was that, that got Truvada-based PrEP approved and what some of the problems that we've seen here in Los Angeles are. Um, many of you know that we recently completed, um, just last month, um, a fairly large a 300 patient demonstration project of daily oral Truvada that we did at two sites here in Los Angeles at the um, LGBT Center and at the Oasis Clinic in Compton. Um, and we're, we're not done analyzing that data yet. It hasn't been published or presented anywhere yet, but I'm gonna show you some preliminary data um, from that study that supports that we need something more and something better. And then I'm gonna tell you what I think the better thing is. Um, so this is a really busy, complicated slide. It's, it's in your packets and it's gonna be available online, but it's just a reminder 
of what we learned from the multinational studies that actually got HIV um, PrEP approved by the FDA in 2010. Um, and, and that is, um, the studies showed that it works only if you take it. And I don't think that's a surprise to any of you, right? If you have strep throat and you have to take penicillin and you don't take it, it's not gonna get better. PrEP doesn't work if you don't take it. And the, the, uh, the how well it works in these randomized studies that got it approved was directly proportional to how well people took it. And what this graph is, um, is it's, it's a measure of how well it worked in comparison to the biomarkers of people actually taking it. So they measured drug levels in people's system and saw how much of it they were actually taking on average. And you can see that as you move to the right, which is more taking more drug, the efficacy is greater. And I think that's what we learned from all of those, those trials. Um, these are data from Gilead that they just um, presented um, at, uh, at the microbe conference in Boston this year. And it, it's a subset of the commercial prescriptions for Truvada in the United States. This is not complete data by any means. Um, but it shows that sort of around 2013, there was this uptick in interest in terms of people getting prescriptions for Truvada. And at the beginning, there was a lot of excitement because it seemed like there were a lot of prescriptions being written for women, particularly in the southeast of the United States. But that's kind of gone away. And it's been overwhelmingly um, white, well-educated gay men, not in the southeast, but the northeast and the west, who are getting the majority of these prescriptions. And I think it's clear that um, while it's great that a high-risk segment of the community is getting protected, that there's inequity in who is accessing this. And we need to do better, or we're just going to exacerbate existing health disparities in terms of access to these really important prevention interventions. Um, you can see here a little bit of the breakdown as to in these commercial prescriptions, um, who's, uh, who's receiving these prescriptions. And I would just sort of point at sort of the blue areas in this graph. You can see on the left, this is sort of the distribution of the U.S. population by race, ethnicity. And then you can see the distribution um, of, uh, of, of PrEP utilization by these prescriptions in the middle. But on the right, is the distribution of new HIV infections. So the PrEP prescriptions are mirroring population, but not the epidemic. So this project that we did here in Los Angeles, we were really hoping that we would target um, areas of the county that were most at risk, most affected by HIV. Um, this is some geomapping that DHSP, who was a partner in this study with us, a critical partner in this study, um, uh, provided us to show um, di new diagnoses of, of HIV by zip code and planning area between 2010 and 2012. And the reason I'm putting this up here is we tried to make a similar map of the people who enrolled in our study that we just completed, um, and, and this is what it looked like. Obviously, the numbers are smaller, um, so the colors are different, but I'm going to sort of zip back and forth here, and you can see that sort of the SPA 4 and SPA 6 areas where the epidemic is concentrated are where the majority of our participants came from, which is, was really great because we were excited that we were actually not just getting, you know, sort of people who had heard about PrEP, but people who were actually from communities who were most at risk. What's next? If you, if you believe daily oral Truvada isn't the be all and end all. So, um, so there's another HIV drug, Maraviroc, um, which is an entry inhibitor. So it prevents HIV from entering cells. So that's sort of attractive from a prevention standpoint, right? Because if you can prevent HIV from getting into a cell, then you prevent it from infecting the cell. Um, and, and that has actually um, gone through um, phase two safety studies for PrEP. Um, it's been completed in 400 um, men who have sex with men and trans women who have sex with men. Um, and that was presented at the CROI conference this year. It wasn't pre presented as an efficacy study. It was presented as a safety study. And um, what they found was the Maraviroc was about as well tolerated as the Truvada. But the problem was there were five people who seroconverted in that study out of 400. And all five of them were in the Maraviroc containing regimen arm. So even though it was not a study designed to look at efficacy, that was concerning.
And they also did um, a companion study um, where they did rectal biopsies. It's this sort of cool science where they take people who are taking PrEP medication, they're HIV negative, and they do a colon biopsy, right? And so you have a piece of tissue that has drug in it because the person was taking the drug by mouth, and you put that in a Petri dish, and then you dump high levels of HIV on that piece of tissue in the Petri dish, and you see if that tissue then gets infected with HIV. So it's the only ethical way you could ever sort of ask that question, I'm challenging somebody who's on PrEP, does it protect them? And the Maravrock arms didn't protect as well as the Truvada arms. So whether or not this has a future life or not, I'm a little bit dubious, but we will see. The women's data, the cisgender women's data is being presented at the AIDS conference next week, so we'll see what that showed. Um, TAF, many of you have heard of this new form of Truvada that contains TAF, TAF, instead of TDF, which is the old version of tenofovir. And in HIV-infected people, it works the same, um, but it's safer. So it affects the kidneys less and it affects the, the skeleton, you know, for fractures and, and osteoporosis less. And it works just as well in HIV positive people. The problem is it doesn't get into genital tissues. Um, so we don't know if it's gonna work for PrEP. If it turns out it does work for PrEP, that'll be great because it's safer. But I'm honestly very nervous because the reason it's safer is it doesn't stay in the blood. It goes into white blood cells, and that's why it works to fight the virus in people who are infected, but it could completely not work for PrEP. So please, if you know of providers who are giving it out for PrEP or you have friends who are on it for PrEP, don't do that. Um, it really makes me nervous. Um, there are gonna be studies about it. I don't think it should be done outside of that setting. Long-acting therapies, and this is sort of where we're going, right? Um, and I, I have to just tell you that I'm a little biased about this because I've sort of spent the last two years of my life living and breathing this stuff and I'm gonna be spending the next seven years of my life also breathing it. Um, and, and, and I think this is really cool. So that's, that's my bias. Um, so there's a drug that's already FDA approved. It's called Rilpivirine. Um, it's part of Complera. Um, its brand name is Edurant. Um, it's already available as a pill, um, but it's available as a shot now. Um, and the shot um, is given in the butt, um, and it's two shots in the butt at the same time. And whenever I say that, I always like to stop for a second and say, it's not like somebody takes two syringes and goes, Right, you know, it's one shot and then it's the other shot, but it is both, both buttocks um, when, when I say it, a shot. Um, um, and, and that is finishing up phase two safety studies um, uh, for PrEP. So stay tuned for more about that. What I'm gonna tell you more about today is this drug called cabotegravir. Um, and cabotegravir is an integrase inhibitor. So it's like raltegravir and elvitegravir and dolutegravir, which are all FDA approved integrase inhibitors. This is not yet FDA approved. And the company that's making it is actually looking at it in three ways. So the first way they're looking at it is um, they're giving it as part of treatment regimens to HIV infected people. So the same way you would test any new HIV drug, it's being tested. And the initial tests look really good. It works like every other integrase inhibitor. But what's sort of sexy about it is um, because both those two drugs that I just mentioned are available as long-acting shots, they said, hey, we wouldn't use just two drugs to start treating somebody with HIV, but what if they're already undetectable? Can we keep them undetectable with a long-acting shot combination of these two drugs? And so the first study they did is they took people who had never been on HIV treatment. This is called LATTE. So I hope everybody has your latte. Um, and they treated them to undetectable, and then they gave them pill form rilpivirine and pill form cabotegravir, and it worked. It kept people who were undetectable undetectable. So you don't start with that, but it's maintenance, and it works. And they said, okay, it works with the pills. We have both those drugs now as a shot. So they did, wait for it, this is super clever. Latte 2, the sequel. Um, <laughs> They couldn't call it, you know, cappuccino or cannoli or... But anyway, so they did the same thing. People who had never been on treatment, they got to undetectable, and then they gave them shots. Now, this is good, right, because the real pivoting by itself is 
right? So the ralpivirine plus the cabotegravir is, wait for it, four shots. But anyway, it worked also. Um, you might say, well, that's nice. Four shots is never going to be acceptable. I don't want that. And, and they're working on it. Um, they're working on making it better, and, and they're, they're tweaking it. So stay tuned. They're now moving into studies that they hope will get it FDA approved for treatment. Again, not for starting, but you got to be undetectable because it's only two drugs. They're hoping that there's going to be a third drug that they can play with to make a full regimen and start. But right now, it's just we don't have it, so they can't do it. But anyway... Um, now back to cabotegravir. Um, so cabotegravir um, is also being developed for PrEP, and it's being developed in two parallel pathways. It's being developed for cis men and trans women who have sex with men, and also in cis women. There's two separate pathways, okay? So the one I'm going to tell you about today is the one that's furthest along, which is the one for cis men and trans women who have sex with men. And that's the study that we're going to have here in Los Angeles, cabotegravir for PrEP. There's also some antibody immunotherapies that Dr. Clark is going to tell you about as soon as I finish up and get out of here. Um, and then, so this is really exciting. Many of you know that for pregnancy prevention, there's this thing called Norplant. There are these rods that you can put under the skin. Um, and what's nice about them um, is they give a short-acting version of a medicine. But if there's a side effect or you want to stop it, you can just take out those rods. Right? So they're developing that for PrEP also. So that's what the future holds. Because the problem with these long-acting injections is once you give it, you can't take it away. So if somebody has a side effect, that could be a big problem. So safety is really important, but with these implantable things for the future, um, you could remove it if there was a side effect. So, so that's, what, that's what's coming down the pike. Um, all right, let me, I'm talking too much. Let me get back to, um, oh, hello. Let's get to cabotegravir. Okay. It's, I'm not going to tell you about uh, the uh, real pivorine. I'm going to tell you about cabotegravir because that's what's here. So this is my tribute to Prince. Um, cabotegravir is the artist formerly known as GSK1265744. Um, so you may hear about people talking about it as 744. Um, it's the same thing. It's just, you know, when they start, some people, some, some drugs have this funny name, and then it gets a real name. Cabotegravir is its real name. Um, and as I mentioned, sort of this is what they're doing. There's the treatment stuff that's in progress. There's this um, cis men and trans women um, that's coming along that is going to lead to this study called HPTN 083 that we're going to be opening here in Los Angeles, hopefully in a month or two. Um, and then there's this parallel prevention one that's going to lead to this study called HPTN 084, which um, is probably still about a year away from opening. So. Um, here in Los Angeles, we have finished a study called 077 that was a study of cabotegravir in low-risk people, okay? This is to prove that this drug is safe, okay? So it was done um, in eight sites all over the world. We have four sites in the U.S. and a site in Brazil, and then three sites in Sub-Saharan Africa, two in South Africa, and one in Malawi. Um, and that study is fully enrolled. It's got 67% women. Um, and we're hoping to have the results of it by March of 2017 um, to present to you. But in that study, we took low-risk men and women, and we gave them a pill version of cabotegravir for a month to make sure it didn't give them side effects. And then we gave them shots of cabotegravir every three months. Okay. Now, you might think, a shot every three months, that sounds good. If I'm going to go on PrEP, I want that. And to be clear, it is one, two shots every three months. Um, it's not just a single shot. Um, but as we were doing this study, um, we learned some things that informed 083. And 083 is the study that's going to be opening, and it changed what we were doing in 083. Um, what we learned in the middle of doing 077 is one, two shots don't last for three months. So we had to change in the middle to every two months, but we condensed it into one shot, okay? So it's a slightly larger shot. It's a three milliliter shot, but it's just one buttock, one shot every two months. And the drug levels look like they last really well 
for two months. It would have been awesome had it been three, but it's not. So what 083, the study that's going to follow up on that that we're going to be doing here in LA is, it looks like this. And these pictures are from our colleagues in Thailand um, because they, um, when they read our informed consent for this study, they said there's too many words we want some, some graphics to help people understand this, and they made these, and I kind of fell in love with them because I think they're really beautiful. And we're randomizing HIV negative, high risk cis men and trans women to one of two groups. Group A is active cabotegravir and a placebo truvada. So everybody in this study is getting both shots and daily pills. Group B is people are getting fake shots and real Truvada. So to be clear, there is nobody in this study who will be getting nothing active, okay? People will either be getting active Cabotegravir, the new stuff, or active Truvada. They won't know and we won't know until the very end of the study who got what, but um, it, everybody's getting something that's real. This is how it's broken down, and I know this is a little complicated, and I promise this is the last thing I'm gonna say. Um, so because I told you that once you give these shots, you can't take it away, it's super important to make sure that someone doesn't have side effects before you give them a shot, right? So people who are HIV negative and are high risk and they meet the criteria, come in, they get some screening blood tests, they get some questionnaires, and then they get randomized to what I call step one. Step one is you're taking two pills every day. One is a cabotegravir pill, one is a Truvada pill. One is real, one isn't. Again, you won't know, we won't know, which is real, which is fake. That lasts for five weeks. Why do we do that? Because we have to make sure if you're on the cabotegravir that you don't get a horrible rash or it doesn't irritate your liver or something like that before I give you a shot that I can't take away. So we do blood tests carefully at two weeks on the pill and at four weeks on the pill. And we don't give anybody any shots until all that stuff comes back and it looks good. And then starting uh, at week five, that's where step two starts. And step two is everybody's getting a shot, it's either real or it's fake, and a pill. Whichever one is real, the other one is fake. So someone's getting everything active. But everybody's being asked to take a pill every day and get a shot every two months. And that goes on a long time. And people like to ask me how long, and that's a really hard thing to answer. A lot of studies, they have a timeline where you say the study is a year or it's two years. This study isn't like that. This study continues until we see an appropriate difference between the two arms um, that we can say something about one being better than the other or not or a fixed amount of time. So the longest amount of time someone could be on this study is about five and a half years. So it's long. It could stop after a year, a year and a half, if people aren't taking their Truvada pills well and it looks like the cabotegravir is a lot better. We are gonna look at it really carefully and stop it and then offer everybody the best treatment. But if it looks like they both work really well, it could go on for a long time. If somebody has a side effect or they decide, I hate these injections, you know, after the first one or something, they're like, no way are you ever giving that to me again. Um, we don't just kick people out. We're gonna offer everybody, if you got any of the injections, a year's worth of open label Truvada to get sort of themselves together and figure out what their best prevention options are. That's also really important because the injectable medicine can last in your body for up to a year. So as it washes out after your last injection, you could be vulnerable to getting HIV, and we don't want that. So we want real Truvada, which we know works if you take it every day, on board to protect somebody as this is washing out. If it turns out the injectable stuff is better and the study stops because of that, we plan to be able to offer cabotegravir to everybody so they can continue that. But nobody is willing to commit to that until you show that it's better. So it's not built into the protocol right now. So we have a bunch of objectives. For this study, we're looking for cis men and trans women um, who are at least 18, who are at high risk for HIV. And what we mean by that um, is basically any condomless anal sex in the last six months, 
more than five partners in the last six months, and these are ors, not ands. Um, anybody who's used stimulants in the last six months, anybody who's had a sexually transmitted infection in the last six months. And we're also, because we're really cognizant um, that that may not actually capture some of our most at-risk populations in Los Angeles, we're using a risk score that this guy Hyman Scott at UCSF developed. He's a young African-American investigator who's super, super, super smart. And he's created this risk score based on the HPTN 061 data set that predicts who particularly African-American and Latino MSM are gonna zero convert in these data sets. So this score is done anonymously, so there is no way this can be stigmatizing, or at least we're planning to do everything we can to prevent it from ever being stigmatizing, but it's another way people who are interested can meet the risk eligibility criteria, particularly for our African American and Latino participants who want to participate. Our goal for our United States enrollment um, for African American MSM to be true to the epidemic is 50%. We're looking to enroll a minimum of 10% trans women over our whole study, and we want 50% of the population to be under 30, again, aiming at the most at-risk populations. Okay, so basically anybody 18 and up can come in until we get to, you know, half of people will be over age 30, but we need to be true to the epidemic um, and really target young, most at-risk populations. This is a really long laundry list of the sites. We have 43 sites in eight countries that are doing it. This is a map of where all the sites are. But what I really want you all to remember and to know is that we have two sites here in Los Angeles where we're gonna be doing it. We're doing it at the Care Center and Michelle Simic, who's here, is um, our, our coordinator. She's waving in the back. And we're also doing it at Vine Street where Steve and Jesse and this whole table over there work. Um, and, and Chris, Chris Blades is, is our contact person at the Vine Street site. So um, any questions about that, I'll be happy to answer at the end, but it's time to let Jesse talk. Um, and thanks so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Hey everybody, thank you for having me here. Uh, as Rafe said, my name is Jesse Clark. I just want to go back to the last slide because Chris Blades' email address on here is incorrect. If anybody's writing this down, you might want to correct it. It's ceblades at mednet.edu. Uh, he's, also, he's a contact person for both these studies that we're talking about. So I'm going to talk about the AMP study or the Antibody Mediated Prevention Study. Um, this is a new study being implemented by both the HIV Prevention Trials Network and the H HIV, Pre HIV Prevention Trials Network and the HIV Vaccine Trials Network uh, in an unique collaboration. Um, as a bit of context, I'm sure everybody's familiar, uh, the HIV epidemic is still strong despite many global advances in both treatment and prevention. There's millions of new infections every year, and the toolbox that we have is not effective um, for the epidemic that we have. There's disproportionate representation of African-American Latino MSM as well as transgender women, also African-American Latino, um, and the MSM population in general is also extremely uh, disproportionately affected by HIV. So we have our prevention toolbox, and thinking about this talk, I was thinking about where we were about 10 years ago when I started doing prevention research. At that time, we had a toolbox, but it was pretty limited. We had condom use, we had access to um, social and structural interventions that were related to HIV transmission, as well as cofactors like injection drug use and STI co-infection, but we didn't have a lot more. And over the past 10 years, I'm sure everybody's aware, there's been tremendous developments in the field of prevention, especially in the areas of treatment as prevention, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, somewhat post-exposure prophylaxis, and the microbicides that are coming down the pipeline in terms of both uh, topical, vaginal, and rectal microbicides for the area of prevention. The goal is that we would get to a point like we have, um, as Dr. Landowitz was saying, with birth control. We have multiple different methods if a woman wants to plan pregnancy. She can use condoms, she can use a diaphragm, she can take oral contraceptives, she can uh, get a Depo-Provera injection, she can use Norplant. Um, and we would like to have the same range of options available for people for HIV prevention that, depending on your specific circumstances, your specific partnership risks, um, you would have access to a wide range of different tools and you can choose the best one for you at your specific uh, point in time. Um, so, when we think about HIV, one of the important things to remember is that it's an extremely well-designed virus. Um, 
Every time I look at it, sometimes I think it was created by some evil genius who knew exactly how to exploit the immune system's defenses um, in order to attack the body and actually use its defenses against itself. When we look at HIV infections, so I apologize, I don't have a slide for this, but we see this response in a person who's infected. When somebody is, acquires HIV infection, there's an initial spike in their viral load where it goes sky high uh, and then comes down to more manageable levels as the body's immune system gains control of the virus, and then eventually over time, uh, without treatment, deteriorates um, and leads to immune system failure and illness and uh, potentially death. Um, and we also know that people respond differently to HIV infection. Some people, uh, unfortunately, without treatment, get sick very quickly and lose the battle quickly, whereas other people can live much longer, um, even without treatment. Uh, despite being infected with the same virus. And then there's a subgroup of people who are long-term non-progressors or what is known as elite controllers um, whose immune systems are able to very effectively control the infection over a period of time, uh, even without antiretroviral th therapy. So what is it about these people? What is it about their immune systems that makes them so much more able to control the infection than other people? And we find that one, one of the things that they have in common is that they have these antibodies that are able to control HIV infection, obviously not eradicate it completely once the infection is uh, within a person's body and deep-seated in immune reservoirs, it's almost impossible to eradicate completely, but they are able to control it to a certain extent. So these people have provided both the conceptual and the biological foundation for this AMP study. Uh, AMP stands for antibody media prevent prevention. It's the idea of using an antibody uh, that's made in the lab and giving it direct to people directly through an intravenous infusion um, in order to prevent HIV infection in the future. Um, as I said before, it's being conducted by the, both the HVTN and HBTN trials network, um, and each of them have their own study code numbers. Being a, conducted in the U.S. and South America among men who have sex with men and transgender individuals, uh, and being conducted in sub-Saharan Africa with heterosexual women. Um, and these are the sites in the U.S. It's extremely exciting that UCLA Vine Street is one of the sites. We're the only site in Southern California and one of only three sites on the West Coast. This is an entirely new study and an entirely new approach to HIV prevention. And the fact that we're a part of it um, and that our community can be a part of it is, uh, to me, extremely exciting. Um, it's a new path. Unlike the study, the HBTN 083 study that Dr. Landovitz was talking about, which is an uh, advanced clinical trial of a well-known project with product with a known mechanism of action um, looking for efficacy. This is more of an early stage test of concept study. We're not entirely expecting to see a, a dramatic effect of, the, of this antibody in reducing incidence of HIV infection, but we are expecting to open up a whole new field of HIV prevention, and that's why it's particularly exciting. This will take us in many new directions if it's effective, um, and will open up whole new worlds for HIV prevention. Um, just a brief review of immunology, how does an antibody work? Uh, what you see there is a, a diagram of a, uh, an antibody with both a heavy and a light chains. There are three main ways that antibodies work. Uh, one is sensitization. They serve as sort of a bridge to other uh, cells in the immune system where they can uh, bind to HIV or other foreign organs and alert the immune system to its presence and induce a larger immune response. They can uh, do opsonization, which is effectively groups of antibodies bind the organism, clump it together, make it more easily digestible by a macrophage or other immune cells, cells. Or as we're going to talk about in this study, it can neutralize. They can directly bond to the binding sites in the antibody to prevent it from binding to the host organism. And that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, this is a picture of the HIV with a GP120 uh, cellular receptor. And then the neutralizing antibody with binding receptor and prevent it from binding to the host cell. Uh, the antibody that we're using is called VRC01, or Vaccine Research Center 01. Uh, was discovered by scientists at U.S. National Institutes of Health, and in laboratory studies, it's blocked about 90 percent of the different strains of HIV that it's been exposed to. Um, that's a schematic picture of the antibody. What's important here is that on the left is the GP120 receptor protein that you can find on the cell surface of uh, HIV. Those short red lines are what are called linear epitopes. These are uh, conserved sequences of the viral receptor, uh, which can be recognized by other antibodies. Sometimes they're mutable, sometimes they're difficult to access, and they're not, they're not the best targets for uh, prevention of HIV infection. What's special about the VRC01 antibody is that it targets that red circle, which is actually the binding site of GP120 to the host cell. So it, instead of just targeting a short linear strand of the, of the receptor, it targets that whole three-dimensional area um, in a way that other antibodies cannot, and actually prevent it from binding to the, cell, to the host cell in the first place, as I said, in about 90% of the strains that it's been tested against. There have been preclinical pre trials of VRCO1 uh, in simian models 
uh, with rectal challenge four to four were protected and vaginal challenge four to four were also protected. In contrast, when they were given the placebo, only one in four was protected vaginally and zero out of four were protected rectally when exposed to HIV. Uh, there have been safety trials in humans done as well. There have been three phase one trials, BRC601, BRC602, and HVTN104. It was safe and well tolerated in at least 100 participants. There were no serious adverse effect events. <coughs> Excuse me. There were only mild adverse events noted, and we've actually started this study a couple months ago. There's about 300 people enrolled so far, and there's been no significant adverse events reported yet with these infusions. So the main questions that we're trying to answer in this study is, is the VRCO1 antibody safe to give to people? Are people able to tolerate the antibody without becoming too uncomfortable, or do they have infusion reactions or site reactions where they get the infusion? Does the antibody lower people's chances of getting infected with HIV? And if it does lower people's chances of getting infected with HIV, at what dose is it effective? One thing to keep in mind is that as part of this study, all the participants have access to Truvada as PrEP. Uh, we can't give them the medication directly, uh, but we are able to provide them with free access to the medication. So there's a donation program from Gilead where all participants um, can get a free supply of Truvada while they're in the trial um, during the length of the study. But so then the one question most of our participants ask is, if everybody's taking Truvada, then how are you going to see any effect of this antibody? What's the point of doing this study? Well, there's two things. One, we know that Truvada is very effective in pre preventing HIV acquisition, but as well, we've just seen, uh, a lot of people don't take it. And often it's the people who need it the most who end up not being able to take it on a regular basis and not getting sufficient protection from the Truvada. Um, so even if people have free access and we're doing everything to encourage regular adherence, still people aren't going to be taking it regularly. Um, and are likely to be at risk of acquiring HIV infection anyways. <coughs> in that subgroup of people, we could potentially see an effect of the VRCO1 antibody in preventing HIV infection. The other question for me is that uh, there's other issues that are more interesting at this point in time. As I said, this is a test of concept study. This is an entirely new approach to HIV prevention that we're evaluating. So a straight up or down test of efficacy is not the most um, interesting question to me at this point in time. We want to know things like, does this antibody influence cytokine production or modulate the host immune response in order to more effectively prevent HIV infection in ways that we don't understand yet? Um, if it is effective, if we do have uh, some show of efficacy, can we modify the, the antibody? Can we optimize and develop new antibodies um, that can last over a longer period of time? So instead of giving a passive infusion once every two months, we could potentially give an infusion once a year or um, even give an infusion that induces the body's own immune system to, to develop its own antibodies and re react to the, um, to the infection so that you would only get, need to give an infusion once every few years or once in a lifetime, sort of like a vaccine. Um, so these are uh, other, it's the basic science and immunological questions that I think are more interesting uh, questions at this point in time. But as I said, it's a whole new world and uh, we're gonna see uh, where this takes us. Um, as I said, it's being conducted in the U.S. and South America, as well as in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in the Americas, there's, there's 2,700 participants enrolled in three different arms. One arm will get the placebo, one arm will get a low dose of VRCO1 antibody, and one, dose will get a, one arm will get a high dose of VRCO1 antibody. In Sub-Saharan Africa, there are similar three different arms, 500 women in each. Um, the total is 4,200 participants, and the study is going to, each participant will be, will be enrolled for 22 months, or approximately two years. To be eligible for this study, people have to be at least, uh, have to be between 18 and 50 years of age. They have to be HIV and uninfected at the time of enrollment. Uh, and in the Americas, they have to be either a cisgender male or a transgender person who's had condomless anal intercourse with at least one male or transgender partner within the past six months, or they have to have had anal intercourse with at least two cisgender male or transgender partners in the past six months. Um, anybody who's in a monogamous relationship with an HIV uninfected partner for the past 12, 12 months is not eligible to participate, and people who have specific medical criteria, including seizures, bleeding disorders, or autoimmune disease, um, aren't eligible to participate either because of the risks, potential risks of the antibody. Uh, what do participants have to do in this study? Well, as I said, it's a two-year study. Participants get infusions every two months. So they come in, they get either a placebo or the low-dose or the high-dose antibody every two months. Uh, they have interim visits every month. Um, at each visit, we're conducting HIV testing, so participants are getting monthly HIV tests, and there's also interim testing available if people are concerned that they may have been exposed uh, in between the, their monthly visits. We have SCI testing for syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia about every six months, and we have behavioral surveys that are administered um, every one to two months. In total, enrollment uh, lasts for about 22 months. Um, we started this study at UCLA Vine Street in uh, late May. So far, we've enrolled seven people. Um, 
it's really great. Uh, the people that are in this study have made a commitment to spend a lot of time with us over a long period of time. Um, and the reason they often give for participating is that they really want to help the community and they really want to advance science and find a cure um, or a prevention me mechanism for HIV. Um, we share that commitment and I love working with these people and um, we're always looking for new people to participate as well. That's uh, the contact information for ourselves. I'm going to bring it back to the uh, contact information for our community educators and outreach coordinators so that you can get their information if you'd like it. Um, this study is only being done at UCLA Vine Street. It's not being done at CARE. So the person to contact at Vine Street would be Chris Blades, who's here in the audience today. Uh, and I'll bring up his address and phone number here. Again, it's ceblades at mednet.ucla.edu. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shopta, Landovitz, and Clark. Uh, we're going to go into some questions. Um, we're going to start off with uh, commissioner questions, and we're going to go to the audience for questions. For audience members, when is going to be standing with a microphone? Can you please go up to her so that uh, your uh, voice is recorded into the record? Um, after that, we'll come.